Hey everyone, welcome to my updated Next.js 13 course, where we will learn how to use the latest version of Next.js with the new app directory and with React server components. In case you don't know, Next.js is a React framework, which means that it makes React a bit easier to use for us and it also adds its own features on top of React, which just makes it easier to build full production ready web apps that actually do everything you need. As you can see on the Next.js showcase page, Next.js is actually used by big companies. So this is not just a toy framework, this is the most popular React framework right now. And you can build real production websites with it. Now you might be wondering, why do we need a framework on top of React? Isn't React already a framework? Why do we need Next.js? Now in the past, this distinction was very clear because Classic React apps could only render client-side using JavaScript, which means that in a traditional React app, we would get an empty HTML page back from the server where there is no data on the page yet. Then we would use JavaScript to fetch data from the browser basically on some backend and then after it is finished, display it in the UI. This made development easier for a lot of people compared to the server-side solutions we had before, but client-side rendering also has some downsides. For example, JavaScript is necessary in order to render these pages, which means that if someone has JavaScript disabled in their browser, a classic React app just didn't work. They would just see a message instead that says, JavaScript is required to view this website. But client-side rendering also has some other downsides. For example, it's not so great for search engine optimization. Because when a search crawler like Google bots, for example, that crawl websites to index them in Google search, when they crawl your React website, some of these crawlers actually can't execute JavaScript. So all they see is this empty page and they don't have anything to index. Now Google's crawlers can actually execute JavaScript. So a classic React app can also be indexed by Google. But as far as I know, it's not as optimal as if you would get back all the data from the server already instead of this empty HTML page. But then Next.js came along and they added some functions to React that we could use to fetch data on the server and return ready HTML pages to the client. And we also could decide if we fetch the data when the website is accessed in this right moment, which means that there is some loading delay, or we could also fetch the data when we compile the project, cache this HTML page with the data already inside it, and then just serve this to the user when this page is accessed. This means that every user would always get the same page until we compile the project again. But of course, this also meant that opening this page was extremely fast, like almost instant because Next.js also implements some prefetching strategies and so on. So overall, Next.js really allowed us to build search engine optimized web pages that are super fast. Now the playing field changed a bit because React now has so-called server components, which again are a way to render React components on the server, fetch data on the server, and just serve some kind of HTML to the user when they access the page. So this is basically the same that Next.js has done before with their special functions that we could use. But they do all of this in a bit more optimized way. If we use React server components, we don't have to pass any JavaScript to the client. If we use a heavy NPM package in a server component, for example, then this NPM package will never reach the client. It will just be executed on the server to do whatever we need to do with it. For example, render some markdown. And then again, the ready HTML page will be sent to the client. Now, technically it's not HTML, it's some special format they invented, but conceptually it works like this. The difference is now also that we don't have to decide on a page level if we want to fetch data on the server or not. In Next.js before we had to decide it for one page at a time. Now we can decide it at a component level. So we can have server components. In these server components can be client components. Those are basically classic React components that are rendered on the client with JavaScript. But in these client components can be server components again. So this is much more modular now, which means that we can optimize our websites further. So now the question is, what is the role of Next.js now that React has these server components natively? Well, the role of these frameworks is now to basically wire everything together because setting up a project that supports server components by hand is difficult. Next.js provides all of this out of the box for you. And they also add their own features on top. For example, Next.js provides their own routing system out of the box. 
So we can create different subpages on our website just by creating folders in which we put files with special file names, but you will see all of this throughout this tutorial. Next.js also adds stuff like image optimization, so it can automatically resize images for you, which is also important for website performance and SEO. They actually improve server-side rendering, so on top of React server components, we get some improved behavior. And you can actually build your whole backend in Next.js as well, because they provide API route handlers, which only run on the server. And to this server, you can make HTTP requests, just like to an express or some other kind of backend server. Especially for small apps, these API routes are very useful, because then you have a full stack website and can make database requests and everything without having to set up a separate backend server. You have all of this in one project. For bigger projects, you often still need a separate backend server like an express server. This is no problem either. You can also use Next.js with a separate backend, but it's definitely a nice to have feature. Okay, so Next.js makes all of this React setup much easier for us. In fact, in the React documentation, they actually recommend to use a framework because otherwise you will hate your life trying to set this up yourself. And Next.js, in my opinion, is the best one. The company that maintains Next.js is called Vercel and they are also a hosting provider. And their web hosting is of course optimized for Next.js, which means that you can just connect your GitHub account to Vercel, you click some buttons and your project is deployed. Super easy. And all of this server component stuff and API routes is all just works. But if you are completely new to React, then there is nothing wrong with learning classic React first, where everything is rendered client side. And in fact, I think it's a good idea because trying to learn one of these frameworks right away is probably too overwhelming because you have the complexity of React, which is fun, but not easy. And then you have these additional features on top. So if you have never worked with React before, then I recommend that you learn vanilla React first. For this, you can watch my Mern beginner course here on YouTube, where you learn React with an express backend, but it's enough if you just watch the first, I don't know, few hours of the course where we learn the React part. And then if you feel like you understand the basics of React, then you can come back to this tutorial here where we learn how to get to the next level with Next.js. Okay, let's take a look at the project we will be building here. So we will not build the most fancy website because the point of this tutorial is to teach you all the important Next.js app router features in the most efficient way. I want to make more fancy project tutorials in the future, so make sure to subscribe to the channel if you want to see this. But this project here is rather simple. I really distilled it down to the most important things. And we will not only learn about the Next.js 13 app directory features, I will also compare these features to the old pages directory, which means that if you have used the quote unquote old approach in Next.js before, then you will understand how these approaches map to each other and how you can convert your existing Next.js project to the new app router. So on this website, we have different pages and each page will teach you a different caching strategy in Next.js because caching is what it's all about. Caching decides when the data for a page is fetched, when we access the page or only when we build a project or at a certain time interval, we can configure all of this in Next.js. Now this image is a bit big because I set the screen to a bigger size so you can see everything properly. This is the actual size of the web page, but this doesn't matter, I will keep it like this. Now here comes the interesting part, the endpoint where we get this image from, from the Unsplash API, returns a random image every time we make a request to this endpoint. So normally when we refresh the page, we should get a new image back. But since I said static caching for this page, this data is only fetched at compile time, which means that when we refresh the page, we actually see the same image again. We see the same image until we build the project in our IDE again. So now I went ahead and compiled the project again. I'm going to start it again. Then when we refresh the page, we will see a different image. Because again, this is fetched at build time and then cached. It takes a moment to load the image, probably because we are on a free Unsplash account. So I guess it's a bit slower. But there is our image and if we refresh the page, we get the same image again. Whatever this person here in this photo is doing, I don't know. But this is not how I tie my shoelaces. Anyway, the opposite of the static caching is this dynamic page here. This page is not statically cached. Instead, we make the request to the exact same endpoint as on the static page, 
just that here we do it each time this page is accessed. So if I refresh this page, I get a newer picture back from Unsplash. The code and the markup for these two pages is almost exactly the same, just the caching behavior is a bit different and you will learn all of this in just a moment. And all of this was possible before the app router in the older versions of Next.js, but now it all works a bit differently. But there is also a, a middle way between static and dynamic rendering, which is called incremental static regeneration or short ISR. With ISR we can say, okay, fetch and cache the image statically, just like on the static page, but revalidate it in a certain time interval. Here I've set the time interval to 15 seconds, which means that for a duration of 15 seconds we will get the same image back, just like on the static page, and every user gets this image back. But once a user opens this website after this time window is over, Next.js will go ahead and render this page again with new data. So this is a middle way between the static and the dynamic rendering. So now since more than 15 seconds are over, if I refresh the page, we should see a new image. But for the duration of 15 seconds, when I refresh the page again, we see the same image. Until another 15 seconds have passed, then when we refresh the page, it will trigger a newer re-render. So we have to refresh it twice after 15 seconds. The first refresh will show the old image and trigger the re-render and the second refresh will then show the actual new page. So 15 seconds should be over by now and there is the new image. And again, for 15 seconds we see the same image. This is a really useful feature because this way you can serve static pages to your users which are just very fast to load because you don't have to make a request to the backend every time this page is opened. But you also get relatively up-to-date data depending on how big you set this time window here. For some pages it's enough if they are refreshed every hour or so. For some maybe every five minutes. Depends on what you need. And these dynamic pages load just as fast as the static pages because they don't need to fetch anything when the page is opened. Whereas the dynamic page took a moment before the request to the Unsplash API was finished. We will also learn about dynamic routes which allow us to put something in the URL that can change. So here we are showing fitness images and this page is also statically rendered and cached. This is why it opened so fast. But this part of the URL is actually dynamic, meaning that we can replace this for any word, like, I don't know, sunny, for example. Then when we open this page, it will behave like the dynamic page. It will fetch the data from the Unsplash API, generate this page, and then cache it. So if I refresh this page again, we should see the same data. And then we also have the search page, which uses good old client-side fetching, just like in a vanilla React app. So of course, even in Next.js, we don't have to use server-side fetching. We can also fetch data client-side with effects and state. This requires JavaScript to be executed, but this is useful whenever you need some sort of interactivity. For example, here I can type in docs, for example, it will show this progress spinner, fetch some images from the backend and show them in the UI. So we learn how all of this works. And we also learn about other features that are important in Next.js 13. For example, how to set the metadata for each page. For example, the title you can see here at the top, this works a bit differently now as well, compared to the old pages directory. We also learn how to use the next image component, which as I touched on before, automatically resizes images. So the image we get back from the Unsplash API is actually a lot bigger than this. But if we open this image in a new tab, we can see that it has the perfect size for how we display it here. It's just slightly bigger, but it's much smaller than the image we get back from the API. And we can also see that we have this special underscore next image URL where we load this image from. This is because, again, Next.js resizes these images automatically for us, which just makes them faster to load. So this is a very useful feature that Next.js brings out of the box. We will also set up an API endpoint, so one of these backend routes. So you will learn how this works as well. And at the end, we will even deploy everything to Vercel. And Vercel even gives you a URL for free, so you will be able to reach your website over the internet, not just on localhost. And of course, we will write all of this in TypeScript because vanilla JavaScript is for lunatics. Okay, so again, if you don't have any React experience yet, you should watch my Mern beginner course first. 
at least the React part. There is no Next.js pre-knowledge required to follow along, so if you are a complete Next.js noob, this is fine, I will teach you everything. Before we start, make sure to subscribe to the channel because I want to make many more tutorials like this with more advanced projects using Next.js and React and maybe some other frameworks in the future. And I also want to give a shout out to my paid course because I actually have a paid Next.js course where we build a bigger project with more advanced features and there we actually build a whole separate Express backend and we really make it production ready with everything that is required and we deploy everything. And when I recorded the course about one or two months ago, I used the pages directory in Next.js, but I'm currently working on an update where we uh, migrate all of this to the new app directory. And this is especially useful because there you learn how to use the old approach and then how to refactor it to the new approach. And you can see how all of this relates to each other. I think knowing the old approach with the pages directory is still useful because the new app router still has some bugs actually. There are a lot of issues on GitHub and I personally have already filed a lot of bug reports. So the old pages approach will still be used in companies probably for years and Next.js they already confirmed that the pages router will be supported for many more major versions of Next.js so many more years to come. So again I think it's useful to learn both approaches which we do in my paid Next.js course, you can find the link under codingandflow.com slash Next.js. I will also put it in the video description below. And in this tutorial here, we will completely focus on the new app router approach. All right, then I wish you a lot of fun with this course. In order to work with Next.js, we need Node.js installed on our machine. If you have worked with React before, then you probably already have Node installed. We can check this by typing in Node-V and it shows version 18.15 for me. If it doesn't show anything for you, go to nodejs.org, install the latest LTS version, just follow the installation instructions, then type this command again and then you should see something here. Then creating the actual Next.js app is very easy because Next.js provides this create next app command that we can use, which sets up a new Next.js project with everything already wired together. So we can execute this with node with this command here. Gonna copy this into the command line. You can type this out by hand if you want. Then we press enter and now the setup will ask us some questions. Now if you watch this tutorial in the future, then some things might change. For example, packages that we use get new versions and sometimes this breaks things. So what I will do is I will also put a link to the starting code of the project I'm using here with all the dependencies already installed and the project already set up into the video description below. It's a GitHub link for the starting code. If you watch this tutorial in the future and things stopped working, instead of setting up the project manually like we do here, you can download the starting code and use this one instead. But if you are brave enough, you can also set up a completely new project. This is what we are going to do now. So it asks us for a name for our project. You can call this whatever you want. I'm gonna call this Next.js 13.4 Image Gallery. 13.4 is the version of Next.js we are using in this tutorial. We press enter. Then it asks us if we wanna use TypeScript. We select yes with the arrow keys and press enter again. ESLint as well, this just helps us find mistakes in our code. We will not use Tailwind CSS here. We will use Bootstrap instead. Now I know that Bootstrap has fallen out of favor a bit and Tailwind CSS is more modern, but it's just easier to set up a quick small project with Bootstrap instead of having to write all the CSS ourselves. But this is not the only reason I pick Bootstrap here. These component libraries like Bootstrap also need some special handling now with React server components and I wanna show you how this works. So for Tailwind CSS we select no, and again, all of this is already set up in the starting point project, which you can find in the video description below. The source directory is optional. It just puts all your source code into this folder. I like this for organization, so I select yes here as well. I accidentally pressed enter two times. So the next question here is if we want to use the app router, we select yes, because this is the new approach, right? The old one was the pages directory, but this tutorial uses the app router. Would you like to customize the default import alias? No. And this should be the last question. Now we have to wait a moment and this sets up our new Next.js project. 
When this is finished, we can close the command line and open the folder where we set up this project. Here it is, and then we can right click and open in code. If you don't have this option available, you can also just open VS Code and drag and drop the folder in there, or just click on open inside VS Code and open this folder here. Okay, so and this create next app command set up this project with a lot of files already inside it. We have the TypeScript configuration because we selected TypeScript in the setup. We have of course a package.json with the dependencies and some scripts. We have a next configuration. We have a git ignore in case we want to push this project to GitHub. And we have the SRZ folder which contains the actual files that make up our website. Before we run this project, I want to install the bootstrap dependencies that we will use here. So we open the terminal, which you can do with this command, new terminal, and then we type in. And again, this is only necessary if you are not using the starting point project from GitHub that I provided. Only if you followed the manual setup. In the starting code, the dependencies are already installed. We type in npmi, short for install, bootstrap, space and react bootstrap. This is actually the only dependency we have to install. This is the only thing we will use in this project beyond the ones that already come with a newer Next.js project. Okay, and then we can actually run this project in development mode, which we do with npm run dev like this. And this is a script that is set up by default in the package.json. It executes this next dev command, which again runs this Next.js website in development mode. So as you can see, this by default runs on localhost 3000. So you can open a browser window and just go to localhost 3000 and you see this yeah, boilerplate page that is set up by default. Of course, we will get rid of this page eventually and set up our own pages. So that's what we will do in the next section. Okay, and the front page we can see here on localhost 3000 is coming from this page.tsx file. This is where all the JSX code for this front page layout here is in. And this page.tsx is inside SRZ and then in the app folder. And the app folder is where we put all the code for our pages in the newer Next.js app router. Before we had the pages folder, now we have this app folder. In the pages folder, this file was called index.tsx. Now it's called page.tsx. So they are equivalent. And whenever we wanna create a page that we show on our website, we have to create such a page.tsx file. And we will create more of these pages in a bit. Next to the page, we have this CSS module, which contains CSS yeah, just for the front page. In case you haven't used CSS modules before, they are basically a way to scope CSS just to a specific file. So here we import page.module.css. And this way, the CSS classes we set up here are only in effect on this one component. This is just a nice way of organizing CSS because this way we don't have to set up a bunch of global classes that can interfere with each other. Instead, the main class here, for example, will only be applied on this page and we can have a separate main CSS class on another page later. Now, the big difference to the old pages directory is that we can now put these files like CSS files and other files directly into our app router next to our pages. In the old pages directory in Next.js, this was not possible. There we had to put these files outside of the pages folder into a separate folder. So now we can co-locate these files, which is really nice for organization. Then another important file is this layout.tsx file. And again, the name of this file matters. If you change the name of page.tsx or layout.tsx, this will stop working. This layout wraps our whole application. So the home page tsx file is actually rendered right here as the children inside the body tag. If we navigate to a different page later, it will also be rendered in here. So the layout is where we can put a navbar, for example, that should be shared between all the separate pages of this app. So if we have used the pages directory in Next.js before, then this is the equivalent of the underscore app and the underscore document file. They now merge into a one layout file. 
And you can actually create nested layouts as well. So again, this layout here is applied to the whole app, but you can also have sub layouts only on certain routes that should share some similar elements like a sidebar, for example, but this is more advanced. For simple apps, it's usually enough to have a single layout in the app folder that wraps the whole application. And again, later in here, we will put the navbar. From pages and layouts, we can export this const metadata. And again, the spelling is important. It has to be spelled exactly like this in our lowercase. Yeah, and this way we can define the metadata of a web page. For example, the title is what's shown up here in the tab. And the description will be shown, for example, when we paste a link to our website on social media later, like Twitter or Facebook. So let's actually change this. And I'm going to use double quotes, but this is just personal preference. I set the title to Next.js 13.4 image gallery. And as soon as I save this, we can see the change here in the tab. Now the title has changed. Again, we can set a different title for different sub pages of our app. We will do this later. And since we set this title in our layout that wraps the whole application, this will basically be used as the fallback. So whenever we don't set a more granular title on a specific page, this one here will be used. So this is the global title, so to speak. I'm also going to change the description to a tutorial project by coding and flow. We can't see the description here because it's not shown in the browser. But again, this is shown, for example, on social media when you paste a link to your website. We also have this global CSS file, which is imported here. So earlier I explained how CSS modules work, but we can still use global CSS as well. So whatever we put in here will be applied to all pages throughout our homepage. And to set up our own route, we have to create another page.tsx file. But we already have one at the root folder, right? Which points to the root URL, which is localhost 3000. Let's say we want to create a page under localhost 3000 slash hello. For this, we have to create a new folder in the app directory with the relative URL. In this case, hello, this is just an example. And then in here, we put a page.tsx. Again, it has to be called page.tsx because this tells Next.js, okay, whatever we put in here should be rendered under this URL. So now here we can export a component, which we do with export default function. The name of the component is up to you. You can call this page, you can call this hello page, whatever you want. And in here we will simply return a div that says hello next.js 13 maybe. We save this and then we can navigate to localhost 3000 slash hello. And there's our page. Doesn't look beautiful yet, but now we know how we can set up pages in our Next.js 13 app. So again, the naming of the page TSX file is important and it's the equivalent of the index.tsx file in the old pages directory. Now it's called page.tsx. In the old pages router, the file name could be part of the URL. So we could name this Bazinga, for example, and we would reach our page under slash hello slash Bazinga. Now in the app router, this is not the case anymore. Now we always have to name this page.tsx. There is no other name possible. And the URL structure is completely defined by the folders where we put this page.tsx file in. If we wanted to have our page available under slash hello slash bazinga, then we have to create another folder called bazinga inside the hello folder. This is how you create these nested URL routes. Now in the layout, which remember wraps the whole application, by default we have this font here set up. This is a Google font and Next.js comes with these Google fonts out of the box, which are then stored on your server, which by the way is also great for privacy, because then we don't have to fetch these fonts from Google. They are coming from our own server. You can also try out different fonts. All these Google fonts are available here by default. We will stick to Inter. And it's applied down here in the body and the body wraps all our pages. So if we remove this class name, the font should change on our hello page to this very hideous font, but also on the front page if we refresh this, because again, this is applied to the whole app. 
but this looks terrible, so let's add this in the font back. And again, any element that we want to share throughout our whole app on all pages, we can also put into this layout. So let's reformat the code. And for now, let's put a div in here. Later, we will replace this for an actual navbar. But for now, I just put some text here. This div is shared across layouts. Now, when I save this, we should see this div here. Okay, it's hidden by this top section. So let's remove this quickly in the home page.tsx file. So this one right here in the app folder, not the hello one. And if we remove this part here and save this, yeah, we see our shared div. When we navigate to slash hello, we see this div as well because this is inside our app layout. Okay, so layout.tsx and page.tsx are special files in Next.js because just by giving them these names, they fulfill a certain purpose. And there are more of these special files in Next.js that all play a certain role in our router. For example, if we try to go to a page that doesn't exist, like hell, for example, we get to this generic 404 page. This is set up in Next.js by default, but this is not great because our shared div is not here. And in fact, nothing in our app layout is here. So even if our app has a nice background color, for example, and branding, none of this will be shown here. We get this very bland white 404 page. So it's a good idea to replace this for our own 404 page. And we can do this again by creating a file directly inside our app folder here. It has to be placed here and it has to have this exact name, not minus found.tsx. This automatically turns this into the 404 not found page. This is why when I create this file, the screen here becomes empty because right now we are not exporting anything from this file yet. So let's export a simple page here. Again, export default function, gonna call it not found. Again, the name is up to you. And here we want to return some layout. Again, we will keep it simple, but you can make this more sophisticated in your own project. Here I'll put a div. In this div, I put an h1 headline, which will say not found, and maybe some text below. Sorry, this page does not exist. And when we save this, we should see this here. Let's refresh the page. And there it is. Again, it's not beautiful, but it works just like me. But now the difference is we have our quote unquote branding because we have our own background color and we even see our shared div, which means that if we have a navbar in our app layout, this navbar will still be visible even on the not found page. The next special file that we can set up is the loading page for when one of these pages here takes a while to load, we will see this loading page instead. Again, we have to put this into the app folder but again, you can create more granular loading pages inside your different routes. So we could also put a loading page into hello, which will only be used when we navigate between any routes inside the hello folder. Usually you want to have at least one global loading page right in the app folder, because this by default will be used for all pages. Again, the naming is important. It has to be called loading.tsx or JSX if you use JavaScript but the name of the file must not be different. Let's set up a very simple layout here. Again, export default function. And here we will return just a div for now that says loading. And I forget the function name. Again, this is up to you. I'm gonna call this loading. Now the loading page will only show up if there's actually some delay in the page we are trying to open. So let's go into our hello page once again. And now we do something mind blowing if you come from vanilla React. We turn this function into an async function. And then in here I will put an artificial delay, which we can do with await, new promise. This is just a little trick to insert an artificial delay. Just type out exactly what I'm typing here. Resolve and we create an error function and call set timeout to which we pass resolve and the delay, for example, one second. 
So again, this just creates a promise which waits for one second and we await this right in here. So we only get to this part after this one second is over. This is just a delay. And now when we save this and open the hello page again, we should see the loading page for one second. As you can see, the text says loading and then it's replaced for the actual page. And the reason why we can just make this component in async function is because by default in the Next.js 13 app router, all components are server components by default. Meaning that whatever code we put in here will only be executed on the server. This will never reach the client. Meaning that we can await async code in here. We can even make API calls and put sensitive data and credentials in here. Instead, the client only gets back this part here, basically, the rendered HTML with the data already inside it. If we need interactivity, so a state or effects in React or click handlers, for example, that should do something when we click a button or APIs that are only available in the browser, like the local storage, for example, then we have to make this a client component instead of a server component. And if you try to do this wrong, you will just get an error. So for example, let's put a use effect in here, which we normally have available in React, right? Just put a use effect in here with an empty block. Save this, then we get an error. You're importing a component that needs use effect. It only works in a client component, blah, blah, blah. And in order to turn such a server component into a client component, we have to go all the way to the top above the import statements. It has to be at the start of the file. And here we just add a string, which says use client. This turns this into a client component. Now we still get an error because now this can't be an async function anymore. It's just a normal client component, but now we can use use effect in here. And when we make a component, a client component, all components that we use inside this component are also considered client components. Meaning that you don't always have to put this use client string here, which is also called a directive, into every single client component. It's enough if you put it in the topmost client component. And again, all components that we use in here are client components as well. So if we would render a bunch of, I don't know, a block, posts, for example, and we have a blog post card component, then these blog post card components would also be considered client components if we use them in here. If we use them inside a server component, they would be server components, unless we put use client directly into this blog post card component as well. So this always trickles down to the components we use in here. There is one exception for that, which we will learn about in a moment where we can put server components into client components. But generally, it's a good idea to try to move this use client as slow as possible. Only use it where you actually need it because server components are just more efficient and you should use them until you actually need a client component, which again is the case if you need state or effects or custom hooks that use any of these hooks or browser APIs like local storage. So since we don't actually need the use effect in here, I'm going to revert this to a server component. And there is one more special file we can set up. Again, we do this in the app folder here. This one is called error.tsx. And this will be shown for any unexpected error that happens inside our components. And the error page has to be a client component. I'm not sure why. I just know that it has to be one. So we put the use client directive all the way at the top. And then we export a page here as well. Export default function. We don't need to do anything asynchronous and we couldn't because this is not a server component. And again, we return a simple UI here. A div with an h1, which will say error and I also put this emoji here. Of course, you can set this up however you want. Again, I put some text in here. Something went wrong. Let's save this. And to try this out, let's throw an error in our hello page here at the top or maybe below the await. So we still have our loading page. Throw error Bazinga. Let's save this. And then we get to our error page. 
This is what the user will also see in production. They won't see this part here. This is just for development to show us where the error originates from. And the error page can actually accept some arguments. And since this is TypeScript, we first have to define a type for these arguments. We do this by creating an interface. I'm going to call it error page props, but this name again is up to you. And the error page can take the error as input. So we can do whatever we want with it, read some data out of it and lock it, for example. And it can also take this reset function. When we call reset, it attempts to re-render the page and maybe then the error is gone. So now we can pass these arguments to the page. We set the type to error page props and now in here we have the error and the reset function. And now, for example, we can put a button in here. Again, a button requires the component to be a client component, otherwise clicks wouldn't work. But again, the error page has to be a client component. This is why we have to use client directive at the top. And here we use a bootstrap button. You can also use a normal button. It's up to you. When we click this button, we will call this reset function up here. And by the way, this has to be named reset because this is passed to us by Next.js. And let's set the text of the button to try again. And then we get this button here. Okay, the styling isn't applied yet because we haven't added the bootstrap CSS yet. We do this in the layout file because again, this should be applied to our whole app. And we put this above the globals.css so that this CSS here is executed first and whatever we put in here overrides the bootstrap CSS. So you can pause the video and type this out by hand. And in case you're wondering where I got this from, this is coming from the React Bootstrap documentation. Here are the installation instructions and the CSS we have to copy. But it's probably faster if you just type this out by hand or copy it from the GitHub repository that I linked in the video description below. Then we save this and the styling should be applied to this button after refreshing the page. Looks a bit better. So now when we click this button, it attempts to re-render the page, but we are still throwing the same error, so nothing actually happens. But it's still nice to have. And if we remove the error from our hello page, of course the page here will render again. Might have to refresh it. So those are the so-called special files in Next.js 13 because they all have a very specific name that gives them a certain functionality. And again, you can also create more granular versions of these different special files. You can create the loading TSX just for the hello routes, for example, or a separate layout. Or you can also have a different error page in the hello routes. But usually you want at least one of them in the global app folder. Okay, one of the reasons I use Bootstrap in this project is because Bootstrap and also some other component libraries need some special setup in Next.js 13 in the app router because they are not yet adapted to this server component approach. To see the problem, let's go to the layout and I want to render all pages into a Bootstrap container. So I'm going to delete this diff here. We don't need it anymore. And instead I want to import this Bootstrap container here. And I want to wrap all our pages. The bootstrap container adds some padding and moves the content more towards the center of the screen instead of the edges here. It just looks better. But if we save this, we will get an error. We get the same error as we did earlier when we tried to use use effect in a server component because these bootstrap components like container use client component features internally. So use state in this case. Again, other React component libraries probably have the same problem because they usually have interactivity. They can usually be uh, clicked in some way or react to some user input. The problem is that these components are missing the use client directive inside their source code. So they haven't been adapted to React server components yet. And we can't use client side features without declaring the use client directive at the top of the file. Now we could theoretically make the whole app layout a client component so that we can use client features in here. But of course this wouldn't be great because again server components are more efficient and we want to use them whenever possible. But there is a simple way of making these third party components client components even if they themselves don't have the use client directive set inside them. For this we create a new file. 
This time we don't put it in the app folder, we put it in the SRZ folder. And we call it components. And in here we can put all kinds of components that we share between different pages. Whereas components that only belong to a specific page, we can also co-locate directly with the page where we need it. In the components folder, we create a file, which I'm gonna call bootstrap.tsx, but you can give this file any name you want. We make this file a client component with the use client directive. And then we can simply export different components from Bootstrap that we want to turn into client components. So we export, then we add this destructuring syntax here from React Bootstrap or whatever component library you use. And in here we can add the components that we want to use in our app. So this is our container that we just set up, but we're going to need a few more going to add them right away. We also want this SSR provider, which is necessary for server-side rendering. I also want to use the alert component later and the spinner for the loading page. So this way we re-export these bootstrap components from our own client component, and now we can use them like client components. So we close this file, go back to our layout, and we change the import here from React Bootstrap to add, which is the root directory, src, slash components, right? And in here should be the Bootstrap file that we just set up. And when we save this and refresh the page, the padding of the container is applied and now it works because this container is now a client component. Now, earlier I explained that everything we put inside a client component is also a client component. So does this mean that every page is now a client component because we put it into the container client component? Well, if this was the case, we wouldn't be able to open our hello page anymore, right? Because in the hello page, we use a server component. So why does this work? Why is hello still a server component, even though we wrap it into the container? This is because our hello page is not coded directly into the container component. Instead, we pass it as a prop. We pass it as such a children prop, which is the special React syntax that you can see right here. When you declare such a children prop in a component, you can pass another component between the opening and the closing tag, like it is the case for the container here. When we do it like this, then we can pass server components to a client components. So the container is a client component, but our pages can still be server components. This is possible because when we pass the component as a prop, React doesn't have to know in advance what the content of this page is. Instead, it just has to reserve a slot in the wrapper component. So there is an empty spot, an empty hole, so to speak, in the container component where we later put our rendered server component in. But if we would hard code our hello page directly into the code of the container component, then it would have to be a client component. This might be confusing at first, but it's an important concept because this way we can have client component wrappers where we still have our efficient asynchronous server components inside. And it's especially important here in the root layout because here we usually have different kind of wrappers like our container or a context provider and we still want to be able to render server components inside our layout. And this is possible by passing the server components as children props. Okay, let's finish setting up this layout here. Outside of the container, I also want to use the SSR provider, which again we import from our own components folder, the bootstrap file that we just set up. Not from React Bootstrap directly, because again, this wouldn't work. We wrap the container with this SSR provider. This is just necessary by React Bootstrap whenever we use server-side rendering. Otherwise, there will be some inconsistencies with the ideas. This is explained in the React Bootstrap documentation. We just wrap our whole layout with it, and then we can forget about it. What I also usually do is I wrap the whole container into an HTML main tag, because the part in here is usually the main part of the page. And our navbar later, we will put above the main tag. Lastly, I want to put some padding on the container, some additional padding. We can do this with bootstrap utility classes, which we can add with this class name prop. We set this to a py 
minus 4, which adds some vertical margin. This is what the Y is for, it's top and bottom. Now we can see there is some space to the top of the page. Okay, let's also make the whole home page emptier. Remove all the boilerplate that we get with a new Next.js project. As you can see, there is a main tag in here, but we now have our main tag here. So we get rid of everything inside the return statement. And instead for now, we will just add a diff here that says home page. We will later replace this. We can also get rid of these import statements. And again, this is a server component by default because we are not using any client features here. So now the home page looks like this. And we can also delete this whole CSS module here because we don't need any special styling on the home page. So let's just delete this. Then I want to go to the globals.css file where again we have a lot of default boilerplate already set up. We don't need most of this. So we delete the max width and border radius CSS variables in here. We can keep the font and these colors. We don't need a primary color. I mean, you can leave it in here if you want, but we don't need it. So we might as well delete it. We can remove this whole media block here. We can remove overflow hidden. I think this caused some problems when you make the bootstrap navbar stickier. Instead, we add the min height of 100 VH, which stands for viewport height. So this is the height of the screen. And this way we have this gradient stretched over the whole height of the page, which looks better. Then we can also remove this color inherited from the links. So they get their normal color back. We remove this last media block. And instead I wanna add a block that targets all images. Here I wanna set a background color to light blue. So later when we load an image, we have this light blue background so we can use it as a kind of placeholder. Okay, let's save this. And one more thing, I wanna go into our loading TSX file again, where right now we just have this loading text. And instead of this, I wanna return a bootstrap spinner. Again, it's important that we import the one from our components folder. This way we don't have to make the loading page a client component. Okay, so we import this from this folder. It didn't add the import statement, so I have to do this manually. Import spinner from add slash components slash bootstrap. And we have to finish this. We set the animation to border. I also add some styling via the class name. Again, I use bootstrap utility classes. With the block, we can set the CSS display attribute to block. And with M auto, we add some auto margin. Then we close this. And this styling here just puts the spinner on the center of the page rather than all the way to the left. Let's try this out. Let's open hello again, which has our artificial loading delay. And there's our spinner, which we see for one second just looks a bit better. But you can also replace this for something else, like a skeleton, for example. But this is totally up to you. And in the next section, we will set up our navbar and we will learn about next links and the new next router hook. And then after that, we will start creating our pages with the different caching strategies. Okay, let's set up a navbar that we can put into our root layout. So we could put this navbar component into the components folder but since we only use it in the root layout, I think it makes sense to co-locate it with the layout TSX file in the app folder. So we right click on app, create a new file, gonna call it navbar. The name is up to you, but you should not name it navbar with a lowercase b. Why? Because the bootstrap navbar already has the name with the lowercase b. And we will use the bootstrap navbar inside here. And then we have a naming clash. This is why I give this an uppercase b. Okay, in here, we will later use a hook. And a hook is a client-side feature. So we make this whole navbar a client component with the use client directive. But this also makes sense because the bootstrap navbar is a client component anyway. And since we don't put any other elements in here, we can just make the whole file a client component. There is no server part to be rendered in here. 
if you don't use bootstrap or don't use any interactivity in here and no effects and state then you can also try to make this a server component which again makes this component just a bit more efficient but the client component is also totally fine okay and here we export a default function with the same name navbar and we want to return some ui element we want to return a bootstrap navbar. So again, we type a navbar, auto import doesn't work. And the import has to be below the use client directive, as I explained earlier. So here we want to import the navbar with a lowercase b from, we could import it from our components folder or from React Bootstrap because we are in a client component here anyway. So we can import the bootstrap navbar directly, even though it doesn't contain this use client directive. But again, whatever we hard code into a client component is automatically considered a client component as well. This is why we can just use the bootstrap navbar in here directly. Okay, so let's set this up. I wanna set the background to primary, which by default gives it a blue color. You will see this in a moment. We set the variant to dark so that the text has a light color. We set sticky to top, but this is all optional. We set expand to SM. This makes this navbar responsive. So when the screen gets small, it automatically turns into a hamburger menu that you can click. This is why I like Bootstrap because it does all of this for you out of the box. And collapse on select makes the navbar collapse when we click an item if it's not expanded already. Okay, we close this tag. Let's make this big. In the navbar, we put a container. Again, I want to use it directly from React Bootstrap, just for consistency. And again, this adds some spacing to the elements inside the navbar. Then in here, we put a navbar, again with a lowercase b, dot brand which can add some icon or text to the left side of the navbar, which you can see on almost any website on the internet. And this usually brings you back to the homepage. So we can make this a link with the href attribute and we want this to link us to the homepage. So we just add slash. And we could add an image here, but I haven't prepared one. So I will just set this to a text. Next.js 13.4 image gallery. Let's save this and put it into our layout already. So we put it above the main tag because this is not the main content of the page. It's shared between all pages and we import our navbar with the uppercase B, important, not the bootstrap navbar. And we close this and then we see our navbar here. And this is the link that brings us back to the home page. Let's also add a link to the hello page so below the navbar brand, first of all, we put a navbar.toggle, which adds this responsive hamburger menu that I was talking about. Then we set this area controls attribute, which defines what this is connected to. Here we have to pass an ID, which is up to us. I'm going to set this to a main navbar. Then we close this with a slash and a closing angle bracket. Then down below, we put a navbar.collapse, yeah, which makes all the elements inside it collapsible. And we set the ID to the same one we set up here in area controls. So again, this is main navbar. And now whatever we put inside navbar collapse will be responsive. And on smaller screens, it automatically turns into this hamburger dropdown menu. Now in here, we put this nav component not navbar, but just nav. And again, we have to import this from React Bootstrap. We close this. And then finally in here, we put a nav link that brings us to the hello page. So again, opening angle bracket nav dot link. We set the href just like for the brand item. This time to slash hello, because this is where we want to navigate to when we click this link. We close this and we set the text to hello. So now when we click this drop-down menu, we have our hello page to which we can navigate. And when we make this bigger, the navbar expands and we see the menu item right here. So this is a responsive navbar. 
But the behavior of these links here isn't great yet because these behave like normal HTML links, like normal anchor tags. Meaning that when we click on a link, the page hard reloads. We can see it here from the top in the browser that we get this yeah, loading indicator. And when we navigate to the hello page, we see the loading spinner again. This is not how we should navigate within a Next.js app because this way we lose all the state in our React components. And if we fetch the user that's logged in, for example, then we would also lose the state and we have to refetch it again. This is just very inefficient. It also makes the navigation look very flickery because whenever we click a link, we have this hard refresh and sometimes the page even flickers. We also lose any caching that's stored inside the router because Next.js sometimes optimizes the navigation by caching pages that we already navigated to or even prefetching links that appear on the screen. So instead we have a special link class in Next.js that we should use for navigation. So now what we could try is we could go in here, we could remove the href attribute and wrap this text into this link component, which we export from next slash link. This is the link we want to use. We give this the same href attribute that brings us to the front page and we wrap this text inside it. So when we save this, we can see that the styling of the brand text disappears, but at least the behavior will be better now. So now when I click the front page, we don't get this hard refresh. Instead, we navigate pretty much instantly and we don't lose any state in our components, just that the styling here is now off. Now, of course, we could fix this with CSS, but Bootstrap actually has an easier way to handle this. So instead of nesting the link here inside the navbar brand, we can add the S attribute to the navbar brand. This way we can tell Bootstrap to use a different kind of component here, but render and style it like a navbar brand. And in here again, we pass the link. Now this whole navbar brand turns into such a next link. So we can remove these inner link tags and just again add the href attribute here. Now we have the best of both worlds. Now we have the styling of the navbar brand, but it behaves like a next link. So this is a special bootstrap prop, but I know that other component libraries have similar props available that let you render different kinds of components. And we can do the same down here for the nav link. Again, we pass the s prop with one s and pass the link here as well. And now we have this proper navigation through next links within our app. Much better. One more thing I want to improve. I want to highlight whatever menu item we are currently on. So now the hello page is highlighted even though we are not on the hello page because we clicked this earlier. We can fix this on the nav link opening tag with this active prop. When this evaluates to true, the hello link will be highlighted. And when do we want this to be highlighted? Well, we want the hello link to be highlighted whenever we are on slash hello, right? So we have to get the current path we are on, the current URL inside this component. In the old pages directory, we did this over the next router that we could import with the use router hook. The app directory also has a router that we can get with use router but not from next slash router. This one will not work in the app directory. We have to import it from a different file, but auto import didn't suggest it. So I have to do this manually. We have to import it not from next slash router, but from next slash navigation. This is the one that will work with the app router. And here we can get the use router hook. Now again, in the pages directory, we could now get the current path out of this router. But if you add a dot here, you can see that there is no such value or method in here available anymore because now they have split up the router functionality into three different hooks. We have use router, which allows us to uh, programmatically navigate between different pages with router.push and so on. If we want to have the URL that we typed in, we use a separate hook instead, which is called use path name. This is where we can get the current path from. This is actually of type string. So right now this is slash hello. 
And there is a third one of these hooks called use search params. This way we can get the search params out of the URL. Search params, in case you don't know, are these attributes that we can pass behind the question mark. We only need the path name in this case. So I'm gonna delete use search params and use router. You can also remove this import here, but we keep the path name. Because down here we wanna check if path name, which is this variable up here, is equal to a string slash hello. Then we wanna set this menu item to active. And if not, it will not be highlighted. So right now we are on the hello page. So hello is highlighted. And when we go to the home page, hello is not highlighted anymore. You don't have to add this. The main purpose is that I wanted to show you these different router hooks that we have in the app directory now. Okay, so now we have the scaffold of our web page set up. And in the next few sections, we will focus on caching. So how we can fetch data from the Unsplash API and the different ways of caching them at compile time, dynamically, and so on. Okay, so now it's time to learn about these different caching strategies in Next.js. And what is actually quite interesting is that by default in a server component, if we just write it like this without any special setup, then this part here will be executed when we compile the project. If we fetch any data here, then it will be put into our layout. And then Next.js will automatically cache this generated layout on the server and we will serve the exact same page to the users until we compile the project again, which then again executes the asynchronous part. To see what I mean, let's open the hello page again. So we are still in development mode and whenever we refresh the page, we see the loading spinner because we have this timeout here, right? But something different happens if we don't run the project in development mode but instead build the project, which we can do with npm build. Uh, it's actually npm run build. Then it does some stuff. It optimizes our code for production and it generates static pages for server components like this one here. So this takes like 20 seconds or so, 30 seconds maybe, or longer depending on the size of your project. And then when this is finished, we type in npm start to start this project. But now we start this not in development mode, but in production mode, which behaves a bit differently. Again, when we compiled the project, our server component here was executed and then a static HTML page was generated. What does this mean? It means that now when we refresh the page, we don't see the loading spinner anymore. Instead, we get the static page immediately. So if you have used the pages directory in Next.js, then this is the equivalent of getStaticProps. But instead of exporting getStaticProps and fetching our data in here, we do it directly inside a server component without any special configuration. We just fetch our data in here and return our layout. And Next.js automatically caches this page at build time. But now let's load some actual data so that we can see the effects of this better. For this, we will use the Unsplash API. Here you can sign up and they have a free tier available, which allows you to fetch 50 images per hour, which is enough to play around with this. So go to unsplash.com slash developers. You have to create a free account here. Then you go to your apps. Then you set up an app. I already have done this. And in here you get an access key, which is down here. Of course, you shouldn't share your access key with anyone. I do this here because I will later delete this key anyway so it won't work anymore. So we copy this access key, go into our project, and you usually don't want to hard code these secrets into your code. Instead, you want to put them into the environment variables because they are not pushed to GitHub by default. These env files, like env.local here, are inside git ignore that we got when we set up a new Next.js project. So here in the root folder, so not even inside SRZ, just outside of everything where also tsconfig and everything else is. We create a file that we call .env.local. Now, why do we use env.local and not .env? In Next.js, you usually use the normal env file for some kind of common configuration and you put your secrets into the env.local file. This is why env.local is in gitignore by default, but the normal env file isn't. 
But of course, if you prefer a normal end file without a local appended to it, you can also set this up and add it to the git ignore. But here we just use the env.local file. In here we add the key unsplash underscore access underscore key. You can give this any name you want, but all uppercase with underscores is usually the naming convention. And then we just paste our key here. You can surround this with quotation marks, but it's not necessary. We can also just add it like this. And then I want to fetch from this endpoint here where we can get a random image from. Somewhere at the top of the page, we can also see the root URL where we have to make this request on this part here. And then we want to call the random image endpoint, get a random photo. So we add this to the URL. And down here, we can see the data that we get back. So this will be the structure of the JSON response. Since we work with TypeScript, we will create a type for this so that we can use these values in our app in a type safe way. But we won't need all of these values here because we will not show all of this information in our app. What I want to have is I want to have the description of the image so we can show it in the UI. I want to show the user that posted the image, which is somewhere down here with a username. And the URLs contain the actual image. I think the raw one is enough because we will resize this image through Next.js anyway. Yeah, and then also the width and height. So we go into our project. Let's create a new folder inside SRZ, which we call models. And in here we add a new file, which you can give any name you want. I'm gonna call this unsplashimage.ts. Not TSX because this doesn't contain any HTML code. This is just a TypeScript file. And in here we export an interface that defines how this type will look like. And we give it a name, unsplash image. So as I already said in here, I want to put a description. And these keys we use here have to have the exact same name as the keys inside the return type. Otherwise, our code wouldn't know which value belongs to which key, right? So the spelling has to be the same. Then we also want to get the user. And for the user, we have this nested object, which contains, for example, the username and some other stuff inside it. We only care about the username. So we add a username string inside here. Then we want to get the image URLs, which are contained inside the URLs object. And as I mentioned before, we want to get the raw image out of here. And then lastly, uh, width, which is a number, and height, which is a number as well. And that's the type that we will use in our app. And we will ignore these other values that are in here. Of course, you can add them if you want to build a more sophisticated app. And then we want to create a new page that behaves similar to our hello page. It fetches the data at compile time and then it caches the static page until we compile the project again. So I want to create a new route which points to not slash hello this time, but slash static because this page shows static rendering, but you don't have to call it static. You can give this page any name you want. So, and we already learned how we can set up these new URLs, right? We create additional folders inside the app folder. So if we want to navigate to slash static, we create a folder that we call static. And to turn this into a page that we can actually open, we have to put a page TSX file inside here, the same as we did it for the hello page. And in here, as usual, we export a default function. Again, I'm going to call this page. You can also call this static page or whatever you want. And in here, we want to fetch data from Unsplash, right? So again, we can make this an async function because this by default only runs on the server. Then we create a const response and we can just make a fetch request to the Unsplash API. You don't have to use fetch. You can also use something like Axios here. That's up to you. But fetch is the easiest one. And the URL where we make this request to, again, is here in the documentation of the Unsplash API. So the root URL is this part. So let's copy this into the string. And the endpoint is at slash photos slash random. And then we also have to pass our API key. 
This is also described somewhere here in the documentation. They tell us that we have to add the API key to the URL as a search param. So we add a question mark, then we write client underscore idea, make sure the spelling is correct. And then we want to append the API key that we have in the nth variables. So we copy this name and we append it to the string with process.env and the name of the API key, right? In the response will be the data of our random image. So the JSON will contain this block of data for which we set up the unsplash image type in our interface earlier. So to get this image out of here, we create a const image equals await. And by the way, we also have to add a weight in front of fetch because this is an asynchronous operation. We want to await response.json, which passes this JSON body out of the fetch response. And this will be of type unsplash image. Now the compiler doesn't know this, so the type is set to any, but we can set the type ourselves to unsplash image, which we import from the models folder. And now we get some auto completion when we use this image variable. Now you might be wondering, wait, but is it safe to use our unsplash access key here? Isn't this sensitive data? Yeah, it is, but as I explained, the server component will only run on the server. So this will never be visible on the client. And there's actually an additional security measure for these environment variables in Next.js. Even if we would use this environment variable directly on the client, it would actually be undefined. It will only have a value on the client if we prefix this with next underscore public underscore. Only this way we can make this variable visible on the client. This is just another security measure so that we don't accidentally expose sensitive information. But since this runs only on the server, we don't have to add this prefix. Okay, then let's set up the layout below in the return block. So here I want to put a div to which again I add a class name with some utility classes. We make this a flex box with d minus flex. Again, this is coming from Bootstrap. We make it a flex column with this attribute and with a line item center we can center everything horizontally on the screen. And in here, I want to put an image. And in Next.js, we have this special next image that we should use instead of the normal HTML image. The next image is what allows us to automatically resize images to a fixed size, which is good because then the user doesn't have to load an unnecessarily large image, which of course takes longer to load. But the next image also forces you to set a fixed width and height so it knows the dimensions of the image in advance because this way it avoids that the layout has to shift when the image pops into existence. So for example, let's say we have an image here but we don't know the size in advance, the height for example, and we have some text below. Then in a normal HTML image, when the image has finished loading, it will pop up and it will push all the elements below it down, right? But this is a bad user experience because it moves around elements on the screen. It can happen that you try to click a button, but then it moves to a different place. And for this reason, it's actually also bad for SEO. So as far as I know, Google really punishes this kind of behavior. So yeah, in the next image, it forces you to define the width and height in advance. So what we do is first of all, we set the source of the image, like we do it in a normal HTML image. We get this from the image that we get back from Unsplash. In here we have the URLs that we defined in the interface earlier. And here we want to load the raw image. Then we have to define a width and height. Now since we don't know the dimensions of the image in advance, some of them are vertical, some are horizontal, I want to calculate this here. So we'll just add some little code above. You could also set the image to fixed dimensions and then use the object fit cover attribute in CSS to center crop the image so it's not distorted. But here, here I'm going to resize the image dynamically. So we will just write a little bit of code here that calculates the width and height. So we create a const width and I want to set the width of the image to always 500 pixels, except when the width of the image itself is already smaller because then I don't want to stretch the image, right? So we can use math.min, 
which is a normal JavaScript function that just returns the smallest value of whatever values we pass in here. So here we pass 500 and the width of the image we get back from the API. So now if the image has a width of, for example, 600 pixels, then we will get 500 back. But if this is 400 pixels, then we will get 400 back. And then I want to calculate the height from this new width so that we keep the original aspect ratio. So in parentheses, we write width divided by image.width and then we multiply this with image.height. Then we get the new height that fits to this width. Okay, and then we pass our new width down here and our new height. And if we didn't pass a width or a height, then we would actually get an error. So we couldn't show this image on the screen. We should also set an alt prop. This is why this is underlined. Lint is complaining. This will be shown for screen readers, for example, which is useful for blind people or people who have bad sight. So whenever possible, you should pass an alt prop with a description of the image. And in the image response, we actually have this description, which we can use here. Now, when we save this and we go to slash static, we should actually see this on the screen if this worked properly. We get to the not found page because we have built and started the project earlier, which means that changes are not applied automatically. So we stop the execution and we execute npm run dev again to run this in development mode. And then when we refresh the page, we should see our image here. Not yet, there is still an error. Invalid source prop. This is because we have to add these URLs where we want to load images from in our next configuration. This is because again Next.js automatically resizes these images and we have to tell it in advance from which URL it is allowed to resize images. This is protection so that no other person can abuse our resizing endpoints. So if you have your own backend where you get your images from, then you add your own backend URL. But here we are going to add the unsplash URLs. So what we do is we go into our project and we open next.config.js, which comes with a newer Next.js project. We go inside the next config block and we add this images value, which again is a JavaScript object. So we add curly braces. And in here we can set this domains value, which expects an array that contains strings for each URL that we want to allow load images from. So this is images.unsplash.com that we see in the error message. But some images have a different URL. So we add a second one here. The other one is plus.unsplash.com. When we save this, it should automatically restart our project. If it didn't work properly, we have to execute npm run dev again. And now when we refresh the page, we should see our image. Fingers crossed and it looks good. There's some blue background and there's the image. Again, on your side, this will be a bit smaller because I increased the size on the screen. So everything is zoomed in a bit, but yeah, this is how it looks. Let's style this image a bit so it looks cooler. We do this with a few utility classes here directly on the image tag. Mm, I want to use rounded, which again is coming from Bootstrap and it adds these rounded corners. We can add a shadow like this. And I want to set the min width to 100% and the height to 100% so it keeps the aspect ratio. And what this is useful for is that the image automatically gets smaller on smaller screens until we reach the width that we defined here. So the largest version is this, but we can make this image smaller. Okay. Below the image, I also want to put a link to the profile of the user that created this image. So below the image, I write by, then I add the next link here because this will link to a page within our own app. If this was an external page, you would use a normal HTML link, so an A tag. But since this will be another page inside our own app, we use the next link. And within these curly braces, we pass a string. This link will point to a slash users slash. This is another route we will set up later in our project, not now, but later. 
and then we append image dot user dot username which is contained in the unsplash response we close this and the text of the link will show the username as well so we add curly braces here and in between we write image dot user dot username again okay so it looks like this Okay, let's save this. And now since we are in development mode, we can actually hard refresh this page by holding control down and then pressing F5. And we actually get a new image every time. If we refresh this the normal way, then we see the same image. And this will also be the case when we compile the project and run it in production mode. Because again, Next.js goes ahead and fetches this data when we compile the project. Then it generates this HTML down here, and this will then be cached and served to the user whenever we open this page, to all users. All users get the same page. So let's build the project again, just so that we see it in action. And in development mode, the log actually shows you when the cache is hit and when not. So this cache miss up here was when we hard reloaded the page with Control F5, otherwise we got the page from the cache. But we can also run build again to build the project and then start it again. And then it doesn't matter if we hard reload the page or make a normal reload, we will always get the same page back. So when we refresh the page, we probably see a new image because we rebuilt the project. But afterwards, okay, it's actually still the same image. But the point is, no matter if we normal refresh or hard refresh this page, we are I will see the same image again because this is fetched only at compile time. And again, this is the equivalent of get static props in the old pages directory. This behaved the same, just that now we do the fetching directly in a server component. But of course, this is not always what you want, right? Sometimes you want to get a new image every time we open this page. And of course, we can do this as well. This is what we will learn in the next section of this tutorial. But before we do that, I want to show you how you can change the metadata of this page. So I'm going to stop the execution and run it in development mode again so that we see any changes to this page immediately. And remember, in our root layout, we have this metadata block here. We can actually copy this and define more specific metadata for a single page. We don't want to change the description of the page, so we can just delete it. And this way it will use the description that we set in the layout. So it will automatically fall back to the description that we set in our layout. We only want to change the title. So I want to set this to a static fetching minus and then the same Next.js 13 image gallery. And now when we save this, we have to refresh the page because we switched from npm start to npm run dev. But now we can see our new title, static fetching, Next.js image gallery. You can also set metadata dynamically. So let's say we want to set metadata that needs something out of the response that we fetch here on our page. And how do we get this up here? This is possible, but it requires a different approach, which I will show you later when we set up a user profile. So make sure to keep watching the whole tutorial to the end, because there I will show you all of these features. One more thing I want to do is I want to put a little text in here that just explains how this page works, so that later when you look at this project again, you will remember. For this, I want to put a bootstrap alert above the image. Alert just adds a background to the text, which looks better. Again, it's important that we import the alert from our own components folder, not from React Bootstrap, because this is a server component. So we can't use React Bootstrap directly in here, because they don't have this use client directive that is necessary. So we import it from our own package. But again, it looks like auto import doesn't work. So we have to do it manually. From add slash components slash bootstrap and in here we have this alert that we exported in this file earlier so we use this up here and in here i just want to put some text i'm actually just going to copy paste it here so this text just says this page fetches and caches data at build time even though the unsplash api always returns a new image we see the same image after refreshing the page until we compile the project again. This is what we learned here, static rendering. 
Lastly, let's add a link to our new static page to the navbar and let's delete the hello page because this was just for presentation. We don't need this hello page anymore. So we delete this whole folder. We go into the navbar here and let's replace slash hello for slash static. We set the path name comparison to static as well and the text will say static. And now we can navigate between the front page and our static page. Cool stuff. So dynamic rendering next. Okay, so now we want to create another page where we fetch data from the exact same endpoint. But instead of rendering and caching the page at compile time, we want to make a request every time we open the page and every time we refresh it. We will still have a server component, so all the data fetching and the rendering will happen server side, but we cache the response differently. So for this we want a different URL, right? So next to the static folder, in the app folder we create another folder called dynamic, because this is usually referred to as dynamic rendering. And here is a cool little trick. As I explained, all these folder names are part of the URL, right? So when we have the static folder, we get slash static. With the dynamic folder, we get slash dynamic. If you put them into subfolders, then these subfolders will also be part of the URL. But what if we want to organize these different page folders into subfolders without these subfolders affecting the URL? This is actually possible. For this, we simply have to put the folder name into parentheses. So let's create another folder in the app folder, but we want to use this folder only for organization. We don't want this to be part of the URL. Then we can put a name into parentheses. So for example, I create an SSR folder for server side rendering. And in here I want to put dynamic and the static folder. We also want to update the imports, but now our URL structure hasn't changed. We still reach our static page under slash static. So SSR is not part of the URL. Okay, and then we want to put a page into the dynamic folder, right? Page.tsx. And this page will look very similar to the static page that we already have. So let's open the static page on the right side. We need the same import statement, so I copy paste them over here. We also need metadata, just that the title will say dynamic fetching. Then we also want to export a page component. So export default async function, async because again we want to fetch data in here, in the server component. Then we can copy all of this part here. We want to make a fetch request to the exact same endpoint, get the image back, calculate the width and height, and then return some UI. So again we have a diff here with the same class names. The alert here will say something different. We keep it empty for now. And below, I also want to copy paste the image and the link to the user profile here inside the div. Okay, so right now this page will behave exactly as the static page. Let's try it out. Let's close this one here, make this smaller again and go to a slash dynamic. Then we should get an image. But when we refresh the page, we see the same image again. But turning this into a dynamic page is very easy. We go outside of the page function, above or below the metadata, doesn't matter, depends on your personal preference. And then we export a const with the name revalidate. This tells Next.js how often it should revalidate this page. And we can set this to zero to revalidate it whenever we refresh the page. So this page will not be cached at all. Now when we save this, this is a dynamic page now. When we refresh the page, we get a new image every time. Because this is not cached anymore, it's revalidated without any delay every time we refresh the page. So this is the equivalent of get server side props in the pages directory. Again, this data is still fetched server side in the server component. This is not a client component. Just that the request to the server happens every time we open the page. This is why we see the loading indicator when we refresh the page, because this takes a moment, right? This has to make a fetch request to the Unsplash API. 
instead of setting revalidate here for this whole page, you can also set it for a specific fetch call. So we have await fetch here. After the URL, we can add a comma and add some configuration in curly braces. I add it here into another line. In here, we actually have this cache field, which we can set to a string. And we can set this to no cache or no store. In Next.js, they have the same effect. They do the same thing as revalidate zero, just on the level of a specific fetch call. So if I comment this out, this should still be dynamically rendered. We still get a new image back every time we refresh the page. Just that now we configured it for this single fetch call here, meaning that we can have other fetch calls in this page that are still cached. So this gives us more fine control because now we don't have to decide the caching strategy for the whole page at once. We can decide it for each fetch call. So again, you can also use no store here. So what I'm going to do is just so you can remember it later, I put it here after a slash. Of course, this is not valid syntax, but I'm going to comment this out. And there is actually another option you can use. You can also configure the cache over this next value here to which you have to pass an object. So another pair of curly braces. And this next object is added to the fetch function by Next.js. So Next.js basically enhances this fetch function with its own configuration. And in here we also have this revalidate field, which we can set to zero. And again, this has the same effect. Let's try it out. When we refresh the page, we get a new image. So no cache, no store and revalidate are all effectively the same. They have the exact same effect in Next.js. I don't know why there are so many different options, but this is how it is. I'm going to leave them in here as a comment. So later when you need a refresher, you can just take a look at this repository and you get reminded again. Let's also build the project to make sure that this does not only work in development mode, but also in production. Just one thing I want to note here, Unsplash has a rate limit in a free account of 50 images per hour. So if you exceed this by refreshing this page too often, you will start seeing errors. Don't get confused by these errors. You just have to wait for an hour until you can try again. And when you build a project, you actually see some icons down here that indicate the caching strategy for these different pages. As you can see, there is this Lambda icon in front of slash dynamic. And this means server side renders at runtime. So this is the equivalent of get server side props, just that get server side props is used in the pages directory not in the new app directory. And these circles here mean automatically rendered as static HTML, so at compile time basically, which is the case for our static page. So let's start this and see if the behavior still is the same. So when we refresh the dynamic page, we should still see a new image. But again, pay attention that there is rate limiting applied. So you can't do this too often. I'm also gonna put some explainer text here in the alert which says this page fetches data dynamically. Every time you refresh the page, you get a new image from the Unsplash API. And then I also want to add a link for this page to the navbar. So I duplicate the static link, change this to a slash dynamic, inactive as well, and the text. And then I'm going to start this in development mode again with npm run dev. Okay, and next we want to cover incremental static regeneration, where we also cache the page statically, but just for a certain time interval. And if we refresh the page after this time interval, we get a new response back. And in fact, every user opening our page gets the same data back. But by now you probably already know how this works. We just have to set a value greater than zero for revalidate. So let's actually copy this whole dynamic folder one more time into the SSR folder and just rename it to a ISR, short for incremental static regeneration. Then we open the page in the ISR folder. We change the metadata to a incremental static regeneration. So this will be the title of the page. We delete no cache and no store because they tell our app to never cache the response, but we want to cache it for a certain time interval, right? We can still do this with the revalidate options. If we want to do this on a fetch level, we can do it down here in the configuration. Let's say 15 seconds. 
If we want to do this for the whole page instead, we can set it up here with this route configuration. Before we try this out, I also replace this alert text down here, which explains what this does. Then let's save this. And then let's try it in production mode just to make sure that this works properly. So we stop the execution of run dev and execute run build. The build icon down here is still this circle and not the lambda icon like for the dynamic page. Let's start this and then navigate to slash ISR. So we see this image. If I refresh the page, we get a new image that's generated. But if I refresh the page again, we should still see the image by Will Rust. But this takes a moment to load the image. Yeah, but refreshing the page shows us the same image. Until 15 seconds are over, then we see another image for another 15 seconds. Now, as I explained earlier, when we refresh the page after 15 seconds, we will still see the previous image. But in the background, Next.js goes ahead and refetches and re-renders the page, meaning that only the second refresh after 15 seconds will show the new data. So now if I refresh this, I see the same image one more time, but if I refresh it again, I get a new image. And again, the same pages are served to all users, so they all see the same image until one user triggers the revalidation after 15 seconds. Let's also add another entry to the navbar. So this will lead to slash ISR and the text will also say ISR. And when we run this in development mode again, we should see the new entries in our navbar. So now you can navigate between these different pages and you have a reminder how each of these caching strategies work. Okay, and next we will learn how we can create dynamic URLs. Dynamic URL means that we can put a variable into the URL where we can enter anything we want, a certain keyword, for example, and then we can use this value on our page to fetch data for this keyword. So I want something like this. I want localhost 3000 slash topics slash, and then we can enter whatever we want, apples, shoes, holidays, whatever. And then we will fetch images from Unsplash for this keyword. So the first part of the URL is slash topics. This will always be the same, right? We already know how we do this. We go into our SSR folder, which again is ignored from the URL. And in here we put a topics folder, which is the first part of the URL. But now we want this dynamic part. And we can create such a dynamic part by putting another folder in here. But this time we put a name into square brackets. And whatever we enter in here is the name of the variable. So this topic down here will not actually be part of the URL. So this will not be slash topics slash topic. Instead, topic will be replaced for the actual keyword. In the old pages directory, you also used square brackets, but there you put it in the file name of the page. Now you put it in the folder name because in here, as usual, we have to put a page TSX. And in here we want to export default async function as usual, which I'm going to call page. And then we want to return some UI down here. Let's put a diff in here for now. In order to get this value out of the URL, we have to add props to our page component here. So as usual in TypeScript, we create an interface which we call page props, but again, you can give this any name you want. However, what you put in here into these page props is not up to you. You have to spell it the same way as I do. Otherwise, this value will not be recognized by Next.js. We can get a params prop in here. And the params will contain this topic variable in the folder name inside an object. So we add a pair of curly braces. And then we write topic colon, and this will be of type string. Now, if this URL param would be called slug, for example, then this would also be slug. Whatever you put in here is what you get here as the key. There is another value we can get out of the URL, and that's the search params. Search params has to be spelled like this. In case, 
And since this can contain any value at runtime, you have to declare the type like this. But I'm going to comment this out because we don't need the search params here. Again, the search params are whatever you add after a question mark to a URL. This is usually used for some kind of filtering or query. And then we can add these page props to the page component. So page props as the type. In here are our params. And inside the params is our topic, right? So we want to destructure this again with a colon and another pair of curly braces. And in here is the topic value we care about. Let's confirm that we actually get the correct value by just rendering it here inside the div as a text. So I go to slash topics slash apples and now we should see apples on the screen and there it is. So now we can use this value to fetch some images from Unsplash. So again, since this is a server component, we can just fetch right in here. Recreate a const response which awaits a fetch request. This time we use a template string with backticks because we have to put more than one variable in here. Now we actually want to make the request to the same endpoint as on our other pages. So let's copy this part here from the string. Let's paste it over here. It's still the random photos endpoint. We still want to add our access key. Since this is a backtick string, we add a variable with a dollar sign and a block of curly braces. And in here we put process.env. We have to make sure that the spelling is correct, so I'm gonna copy it from over here. Unsplash access key. And we can actually add a search query to this random endpoint. Here after the question mark, which by the way again indicates that those are search params. After the question mark, we write query equals and add another variable placeholder here. And in here we want to put a topic, because we want to search for this topic. But we also want to return more than one image, so we can add an ampersand sign like this to add another search param to the URL. Then we write count equals 30, and another ampersand sign for the last search param, which is the client ID. So now we return 30 random images for whatever topic we insert into the URL. And since this is random, every request will fetch new images unless we cache it in some way. Then since we added the count value here, we actually don't get one image back, we get an array of images back. So we create a const images, which will be of type unsplash image again, but this time it's an array. So we add a pair of square brackets. And again, we get this from await response.json. Then down here in the UI, I want to put a topic into an h1 headline and then below I want to render our images in a list. So we want to put a map call in here and we do this between curly braces because this is a JavaScript expression. Here we want to take each image in our images array and turn it into a UI element, right? So as usual in React, we call images.map and again I cover this in my Mern beginner course if you've never done this before. In this map call, we get past each image, right? And we want to turn them into a, an image element. So I put a pair of parentheses here, so I can put this into a new line. And this is still considered one return value. And the semicolon here is wrong. Then we want to use the next image as usual, because this resizes the image properly. The SRZ is the image from this map call here. Image dot urls.raw, right? This time we will set a fixed width and height. They will all be square, 250 pixels. And again, Next.js will automatically resize these images to this size, which is really cool. We want to set the alt text again to image.description. Since this is an array, we also have to set a key. This makes rendering for React more efficient because it knows which data belongs to which element in the list. Again, I cover this in my beginner tutorial. We need a unique value here. And since each image is coming from a different URL, we can use the image URL as the key. Lastly, I want to add some styling to these images, some CSS, because we are resizing them to a square, which can make them distorted if the original image is not actually a square. 
So we put a CSS module right inside the same topic folder because this only belongs to this one page. Let's call it topic page.module.css. Again, the .module is important because this turns this file into a CSS module. In here, I just want to put one tag, one class name, which we call image. We want to set object fits to cover. This center crops the image so it fits into our square without getting distorted. I want to add a little margin of 0.25 rem and a border radius just so it looks a bit better of 4 pixels and that's it. Then we go back to the topic page. We import our CSS module and usually you call the variable styles. This seems to be a naming convention. Import styles from dot to get into the parent folder, which is the topic folder. And in here we have topic page.module.css. And then we want to apply our image class to our image down here. So we add a class name. We set this to a an expression with curly braces and in here we pass styles dot and the same class name we set over here, image. And then we close this image tag with a slash and a closing angle bracket. Now when I make this window smaller, we actually already see images here because I save the changes and they are applied automatically. And the dynamic part of the URL is set to apples. Now let's refresh the page and see what happens. We actually get the same images again. So these pages are rendered when we first access them. Let's try out holidays. This will take a moment to load. We get this back. But when we refresh the page, we should see the same images again. So they are rendered at first access and then cached statically. If we want new images to be generated whenever we refresh the page, we can Again, set revalidate to zero. With export const, revalidate equals zero. Let's try this out again. When we refresh the page, we get new images. But again, there is a rate limit of 50 images per hour. So if you exceed this, you will start getting errors. I'm going to comment this out to make this static again. And you can also tell Next.js to render some of these pages in advance. So let's say we know that we want to render pages for the keywords health, fitness, and coding, for example. And we don't want to render them the first time a user accesses them. We want to render them when we build the project. Then we can export another function from this file. Export function. This is called generate static params. And make sure the spelling is correct. Otherwise, Next.js will not recognize this. This function can be dynamic if you need to fetch some data in here. And this is the equivalent of get static paths in the old pages router. But the syntax is simpler now because the return type is simpler. We just have to return an array that contains our object keys here. So since we already know these keywords in advance, let's create an array of strings. And I said we want health, we want fitness, and we want coding, you can put any keyword in here you want. But what we have to return from this function has to look like this. It has to be a JavaScript object that contains our topic here, colon, and then this keyword behind it. But instead of writing it like this for every single element in this array, we can just map this to this value. So we map each topic to an object yeah, that contains the topic key. So it looks like this. Note that I added a pair of parentheses and then a pair of curly braces inside it. Because otherwise this function will recognize this as the function body with the curly braces. But this is not the function body. This is the JavaScript object we return. This is why we have to wrap this into another pair of parentheses. So let's try this out. Let's save this. Now we have to build a project because this data will only be fetched at build time and then cached. So I run npm start again. And now when we open one of these three pages here, there should be no loading indicator because we fetched this data in advance when we compiled the project. So I set this to coding and this page should load pretty much instantly 
without the loading indicator. That's the important part. We shouldn't see the spinner in the UI. And there was no spinner, right? Now, what happens if I try to open a topic that we didn't add to the array? Let's say uh, um, beach, for example, we enter this. Then we can still access this page, but this one is generated when we first access it because it's not part of our array here and Next.js can't know in advance for what keywords it has to fetch the data, right? Only when we return them from generate static params. And we can also see in the build log that these topics are pre-generated here. Now there was no loading indicator when we opened the beach page, but I think this was just because it returned the data so fast that we didn't see it but it has to be generated dynamically when we first access it. Now, if you only want to allow these three params here and not any other ones, then this is possible as well with another value that you can export. Export const dynamic params in camel case, we can set this to false. Now, when we build the project again, we will not be able to access any topic pages besides these three here. Let's start the project again and refresh the beach page. Now this leads us to not found, but we can still access our other keywords here, like fitness and coding. I'm gonna disable this again by commenting this out, and then I wanna put an alert message in here as well. I put it above the H1. Again, we import an alert from our own folder, not from Bootstrap because this one will not work inside a server component. So we change the import to add slash components slash oops bootstrap and then again I paste some text down here and run this in dev mode again so we can see the changes. This page uses generate static params to render and cache static pages at build time, even though the URL has a dynamic parameter. This is what we return here from generate static params. Pages that are not included in generate static params will be fetched and rendered on first access and then cached for subsequent requests. This can be disabled and again you disable this by setting dynamic params to false. If you don't want to cache the data, you can set revalidate to zero. Now I also want to change the title for this page like we did for any other pages, but this time I don't want to set this to a hard-coded string. Instead I want to put whatever keyword we use into the title. So instead of exporting this metadata value here, we want to generate the title dynamically. We can do this by exporting another function. Gonna put it above generate static params, but you can put it wherever you want. Export function generate meta data and again the spelling and the casing has to be correct and this can actually take the same params as the page so the page props in here we have our params value and in there is the topic right that we want to put into the title this function has to return an object of type metadata from next so it should add this import up here and in here we can return an object and in this object we have our title, we have our description and any other metadata values that we can set. We want to set the title, but since we have our topic available here, we can set the title dynamically from this value. And we could also use the search params in here, for example. So now we can write topic plus, and then we want to append the same part that we have here, minus Next.js image gallery like this. Now when we save this, we should see our dynamic title. Yeah, the keyword is up here in the URL. Fitness, let's try coding, and it has coding in the URL. Now you can also make generate metadata async and fetch data in here. For example, if you want to use some value from the API response in the metadata. We will do this in the next section of this tutorial. For now, I want to put some entries for these topic pages into our navbar just so that the project looks better. So below the last nav link here, I'm going to put an opening angle bracket nav dropdown, which we import from Bootstrap. Again, we can do this in here because we are inside the client component. We can set a title to a topics. 
and an idea to topics oops drop down and then we close this i think the idea is necessary for some accessibility features that's why i'm adding it here it can't hurt and in here we put three enough drop down items for our three topics that we pre-generate we want to render them as next links as usual and then set an href the first one will lead to a slash topics slash health right that's the first one here and generate static params and the text will say health and then we duplicate this two times for slash fitness and slash coding and now we have this drop down in the ui to navigate between our different topic pages perfect okay now i want to create another page that uses generate metadata which we already used on the topics page but now i want to set the value from the response we get back from the api but we fetch it down here in the page how can we get this value up here in the metadata that's the question for this let's set up another page and i want to fetch the user for a username and show some basic profile data so again we have to create a type for this but we will ignore most of these values we will only care about the first name the last name yeah and the username so let's go back into our project and create a new model for this unsplash user in the models folder new file unsplash minus user.ts and here we export an interface called unsplash user and in here we put the username which is a string and again these keys have to match the return type of the api first underscore name and last underscore name and we ignore the other values then i want to set up a new page and again we want a dynamic url just like our topics page because we want to be able to insert any username right so let's create another folder inside ssr called user so this is the first part of the url then in here we put another folder with a dynamic url parameter which we call username and finally in here we put our good old page.tsx so in here as usual we export default async function which we call page and again we want to receive the params so we create an interface page props which again gets the params value but now in here we don't have the topic we have the username because this is what we call the variable in the dynamic url element we pass these params to the page component and in here is params and in there is the username then we want to fetch the user from the unsplash api so we create a const response equals await fetch we use a backtick string and in here we add this url so the base url is the same api.unsplash.com then we make the request to slash users then we insert the username that we get from the params and then as usual we pass the client id so you can pause the video and type this out by hand then we want to get the user value out of the response json and display the user data in the ui so inside the div let's put an h1 that will render user dot user name we have to set the type of the user here so we get auto completion to unsplash user from our models folder and now this auto completes to a username then I put a paragraph below which says first name colon and this will render user.firstname the same for the last name 
another paragraph. And below I want to put a link to the profile of the user on Unsplash. And since we don't use this link to navigate within our own website, we can use a normal anchor tag instead of the next link. We set the href of this link to an expression with curly braces. And here we put a string. We want a link to https colon slash slash unsplash.com. This time without the API in front of it slash and then we want to append user.username. This will bring us to the Unsplash profile of this user and the text of the link will say Unsplash profile. So let's try this out. I saved this. We are still in development mode and let's go to the static page where we should see an image and a profile link that we added earlier. This leads us to this newer route we created slash users slash and the username and there's the profile. And this link here brings us to the Unsplash profile, but this is not so important. Now what happens if we try to open the profile page for a user that doesn't exist? So I just add some random characters here. Then we don't see any data because by default fetch doesn't throw an error for a 400 or 500 response. If this would throw an error, then we would see the error page instead. But both cases are not great. We don't want to see the error page or an empty page. We want to get to the not found page instead, right? If we take a look into the log, we can see that we actually get a 404 response from the Unsplash API for this request because the user doesn't exist. But this 404 response doesn't cause Next.js to automatically redirect to the not found page, but we can do this manually. We can go below const response and we can check if response.status, which contains the status code, is equal to 404, which means not found, then we want to redirect to our not found page. And by our not found page, I mean this not minus found tsx file we set up earlier. We want to redirect here. In the old pages directory, we did this with a special return value from get static props or get server side props. Here in the new app directory, we simply have to call this not found function which again is an import from next slash navigation. This will bring us to the not found page. So let's try this out again. Let's save this. And we get to the not found page because this user doesn't exist, but the previous user does exist. But we also want to learn how we can generate metadata from this response, right? So in the URL, we only have the username. But instead of putting the username into the page title, I want to put the full name of the user into the page title. But we only get these values from the response from the APIs. We have to wait for them. Whereas in the topics page, we just use the params value and generate metadata, which we get immediately because this is part of the URL. So what we have to do, we have to export the same generate metadata function again. But this time we make it async. So export async function, generate metadata, and again, make sure the spelling is correct. And again, we can receive the same params as we receive in the page up here. Again, the function has to return metadata, but since this is an async function now, we have to wrap this into a promise because async functions return promises. Then here we want to return a metadata object and we want to change the title. But again, I want to set the title from the values we get back from the response. But we have our response down here in the page. How can we get these values inside generate metadata? The answer is quite simple. We just make the exact same fetch request up here to the same URL. Now you might be wondering, wait, isn't this wasteful because we make the fetch request twice, but Next.js actually automatically deduplicates these requests. Meaning that even though we make this fetch request here twice, it will only be executed once. And the fetch call that's executed second will automatically use the values of the first fetch call. This is handled by Next.js. But instead of writing the same not found logic and the same URL twice, I want to extract this into a separate function just for organization. We can do this right in here, async function, and let's call it get user, which will take the username as a string and make the request to the API. So I cut out these three lines here, put them in here, but instead of creating a const user, I just run a return 
the response JSON. And to get proper auto completion, we set the type of the function return value. Again, it has to be a promise because this is an async function. And in here will be an unsplash user. Then we use this function down here. We create a const user, call await.get user, and pass the username to it. And since we added this return type here, this user is now of type unsplash user. Then we can copy this line and use it up here instead of repeating the URL. And then we handle 404 responses for both cases. And again, this is automatically deduplicated. And now we can set the title from the data we get from the user, from the API. So we can set this, for example, to user.firstname plus, then we add a space, and user.lastname. But sometimes the first name doesn't exist, then I don't want to have the space here, so I actually change this into a little bit more complicated expression. But don't get scared by this, it basically does the same what we did a moment ago, just without the unnecessary space. So here we have an array that contains the first name and the last name. This part here filters out elements that are not defined. So if there is no first name, then we only use the last name and vice versa. And then it joins these two values and adds a space between them. If there is no first name and no last name at all, then we fall back to the username. And then we have our minus Next.js image gallery. You don't have to do this. You can also use the simple version that I showed you a moment ago. This is up to you. So let's save this and try it out. And now we see the full name of the user in the title of the page. But I want to have the minus Next.js image gallery in there in any case. So I wrap this part here into a pair of parentheses. And now it should be part of the title. Okay, nice. Now, if you are not using the fetch function here and you use something like Axios, for example, or a different way of fetching your data, then these cards are not automatically deduplicated. This is only the case for the native fetch function. But you can do this manually. For this, we have a special function available in React. Let's say get user uses Axios instead of fetch and it's not automatically deduplicated. Then we can create a const call get user cached, but again, the name is up to you and call this cache function, which is an import from React. So this is coming from React itself. And in here we can pass our get user function up there. So now if we call get user cached instead of get user in both places, then this will also be deduplicated. But again, this is only necessary if you don't use fetch. So I'm going to put a comment here as a reminder, which will say use cache if you are not using the native fetch. And again, you can decide on this page if you want to revalidate this for every request or if you want to cache the request, which is the case right now. But you already know how this works. You can add the revalidate field, set it to zero or a number for incremental static regeneration or use the no cache or no store options on the fetch call. Lastly, I want to put an alert down here again inside the diff. Again, we import it from our own bootstrap folder. add slash components slash bootstrap and then again I add some text here. This profile page uses generate metadata to set the page title dynamically from the API response. This is what we have done here. In the old pages directory, we set this metadata in the head tag directly in our page component. And this is now completely replaced by generate metadata. And in the next section of this tutorial, we will learn how to do client side fetching. And for this, we will have to set up an API route handler in Next.js. So a little backend endpoint. And afterwards, we will deploy our project to make sure to watch this tutorial all the way to the end. Okay, so all the data fetching we have done in this project so far was server side, meaning that we executed our API requests inside server components and then returned the ready HTML with the data already inside it, either dynamically when we access the page or statically when we build the project. 
But sometimes you still need good old client-side fetching, which means that we first get an empty HTML page back and then we execute some JavaScript that fetches data from an API and then shows it in the UI. But instead of fetching server-side, this happens in the browser of the user. This is useful if you want to fetch some data dynamically and wait for the response without blocking the UI by waiting for the page to refresh. But it's not as optimal because it requires a client component, which means that we send more JavaScript code to the user. And it's also not as great for SEO because again, search engine crawlers first see this empty page. Nevertheless, there are still some situations where you want to use client-side fetching, so we learn how to do this here as well. For this, we want to create a search page where we have an input field where we can type in a keyword and search for images for this keyword. Since we are not doing server-side rendering on this page, I don't put it in the SSR folder. Instead, I want to create a new folder inside app called CSR for client-side rendering. And again, we put a name between parentheses to not make this part of the actual URL. We want the URL to start with slash search, right? So we put a search folder inside CSR and into the search folder, we put a page.tsx to make this page available. In here, as usual, we export a default function called page. This time it doesn't have to be async because we are not fetching any data in here. Instead, we fetch the data client side. And I also want to export metadata here. Export const metadata. And I want to set the title to a search minus, and then again, Next.js 13.4 image gallery, like on the other pages. Now, in order to execute our search client side, we will need use state and use effect. And this can only be used inside a client component, right? So let's try to make this a client component with the use client directive. And for now, return an empty UI here like this. But when we navigate to a slash search, we can open the page, but we don't see our metadata title here. This is because metadata actually has to be exported from a server component, not a client component. If we remove use client, this should show up in the title. And there it is. But the use client directive always has to be at the top of the file, right? But we only want to make this part down here a client component. This means we have to put this into a separate file. So inside the search folder, we create a new file and we can give this any name we want because now this is technically just a normal component. I'm going to call this search page.tsx and here we export a default function with the same name, search page and let's return just a diff with some text for now, search. We can make this a client component to use client features in here. And then we can return this from our server component here. So here we want to render the search page. And now we see our text here. So now the server component here is a wrapper for our client component. And again, this is necessary because the use client directive always has to be at the very top. But we can't use it here because we need a server component to declare metadata. This is how you put a client component inside a server component. And you can also fetch data here in the server component and pass it as props to the client component. This is also possible. Now let's go into the search page component. And first of all, I want to put an input form in here inside the div. For this, we can use this bootstrap form from React Bootstrap. And again, we can import this directly from React Bootstrap because we are in a client component anyway. So we don't have to use the re-exported version. We set the on submit prop to handle submit, which is the function that will receive the actual input value. So above the return statement, we put an async function with the same name, handle submit. And this will receive a value, which is usually called E, short for event. And this will be of type form event, which is a React import. And then we add a pair of angle brackets like this and set the type to a HTML form element. 
Now our form here will be very simple with just one input field, so we handle it all manually via this form element. If you have more complex forms, then you should use the React hook form library instead, which makes it easier to work with more complicated forms with more input fields. And we use React hook form in my paid Next.js course. Again, if you want to check this out, the link is in the video description. Let's finish our form down here, so we go between the opening and the closing tag. And in here we put a form.group, which again is coming from React Bootstrap. We set the class name to mb-3, which adds a bit of margin to the bottom of this input field. And we set the control ID to a search minus input. The control ID is needed for accessibility. It connects, for example, the label of the input field with the input field itself, so that when we click the label, the input field is selected. But this is handled automatically for us by React Bootstrap if we just set this control ID. In here, we want to put a form.label, which will say search query. This is just the text we see above the input field. And we add the actual input field below with form.control. The input field needs a name, so we can get the value out of it later and we call it just query or search query or whatever you want. And let's also set a placeholder text that will be shown while the input field is empty. I write eg cats hot dogs dot 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 not hot gods hot dogs. This is just there so the user gets an idea on what they can type in. And then we close this form control. And there's our input field. And this is the label. And when we click the label, the input field is selected. This is handled by this control ID here. Just nice to know. Then below the form group, but still inside the form tag, we put a bootstrap button. We set the type to submit, so that when we click this button, it will automatically submit the form that this button is in. Again, we add some margin to the bottom with MB3. And the text of the button will say search. So when we click this button, this form will be submitted and handle submit will be executed. So now we want to get our input out of our form, right? Out of this form event. First of all, we have to call e.preventDefault because otherwise the page will refresh when we submit the form. This is the automatic HTML behavior. But usually you don't want to do this because you want to submit the values via JavaScript. Then we need to get the input values, so our query, out of this form event. Again, when we do this manually, this is a bit more verbose and complicated. React hook form makes this easier, but for just one input field, this is fine. We need to create a form data, which we initialize with newer form data. And in here we pass e, which is this form event, dot target. And for TypeScript, we have to cast this with the s keyword to HTML form element. All this does is it takes our input field here and wraps it into form data because out of form data we can now get our query. Const query equals form data dot get and then we have to pass the key of the value as a string and that's the name we set down here. So we want to get this value out of the form data but the type of this is not string, it's form data entry value or null. So we want to turn this into a string with the save call operator, so question mark. And then we also want to trim this value, which means that we remove any white spaces in the front or at the end of the string, because we don't want to have them as part of the search query. So now the query is a string or undefined if we didn't enter anything. So for now, let's just show a a dialog on the screen that shows these values. So we see that this actually works. So we check if query, if query has a value. So if we type something in, then we want to show an alert dialog with this query. If the user didn't type anything in, then we will not do anything at all. I think there is no error message necessary because it's clear that if we try to search with an empty input field, it will just do nothing. So let's try this out. Let's enter docs and we see it in the alert dialog, so the input field works. But of course, instead of just showing this dialog, we want to make a request to the Unsplash API with the search query. 
Now the problem is we are on the front end here, inside the browser, because this is a client component. This means we can't use our credentials here because they would be leaked to the browser, right? And someone could find them if they inspect the source code. As I explained earlier, unless we prefix our environment variables with next underscore public, they will not be exposed to the front end, even if we try. So let's try this out. Let's try to show process.env.unsplash access key in the alert dialog. When we click this, we get undefined. But this is good because we don't accidentally want to expose this key to the client. So when you fetch data client side like this and you need API access keys that should be kept secret, then you have to route this over your own backend server. Because again, the backend server can execute this and use the key without exposing it to the client. So you could either set up your own separate backend, like an express server for example, but as I already explained, Next.js has API routes by default, where you can build your backend directly in Next.js. So let's create such an API route where we can use our access key in and make our search request. So we put these API routes also in the app folder. And in here I create an API folder, which means that the URL will start with slash API, you actually don't have to do this, but this is a convention because you usually want to put your route handlers behind the slash API endpoint because those are not pages. Those are server endpoints that just return some JSON. So we want to make this request on localhost 3000 slash API slash search. So I add a search folder in here. And then in here, we don't put a page.tsx. We put a route.tsx because this is an API route, not a page. So again, the name is important. You have to call this route.tsx, not something else, because otherwise this will not be recognized as an API route handler. Okay, and here we export an async function, which we call get in all uppercase. And to this get function, we pass a request object like this. This request object doesn't have any import because this is available in JavaScript or Node.js by default. Now in the old pages directory, we had a single handler function. And in this handler function, we had to check the method of the request. This way we could distinguish between a get request or a post request and so on. But now in these newer app route handlers, we have different functions for these different HTTP methods. So we have an export async function get we can also export async function post, patch, delete, and so on for these other HTTP methods. And in here we can handle GET requests to this route, right? So we will pass the search query from the search page as a search param. So the URL will look like this, slash API slash search, then question mark query, and then the actual search query. So we want to get this value out of the URL in here. For this, we create a const that we destructure. We assign it to a new URL. Again, this does need an import statement. And in here, we pass request.url. Request is the value that we get up here. And inside the curly braces, we should now find the search params, which are the search params in the URL. Then we want to get the query value out of there. So we create a const query and we assign it to search params.get and pass query as a string. This value of course can be null because maybe this search param is missing. So below let's check. If query is undefined, we want to return a response. We use next response this time, which is an import from next slash server. And next response is just this normal response value that we also have available. But next response extends this with some convenience functions. And similarly, there's also a, a next request, which is the same as this request type up here, just with some utility functions added to it. On this next response, we can call .json to create a JSON response. Parentheses, and here we put a body. This will say error colon, no query provided. This is just a response we send back if we try to 
access this endpoint without sending a search query to it. And after a comma, we can add some configuration. Here I want to set the status to 400, which means bad request because this is an invalid request without a search query. And then below, I want to make the fetch request to Unsplash. So we create a const response equals await.fetch. This time I want to make this request to this search endpoint here, which doesn't return random images. It returns the same images for the same search request. The return type still contains an array of results, but this time we have this wrapper around it. So we have to create a new type for this. Let's go into our unsplash image type that we already have and add this wrapper type below. So we export another interface, which we call unsplash search response. Again, the name is up to you. We ignore all the values except for the results, which is the array we actually care about. We don't care about these other values. And the results is simply an array of unsplash images. And that's it. Then we go back into our route handler, make this fetch request and we pass a backtick string. And we make the request to https colon slash slash api.unsplash.com, the same as before. Now the endpoint is slash search slash photos. So we add this here. The search query is passed as a search param. So we add a question mark, write query equals. And here we add the query that we send to our backend, right? And then again, ambassand sign, client underscore idea. And we set this to our usual process.env.unsplash access key. And again, this is executed server side, so it's safe to use our API credentials here. And then we will send this data back to the front end, right? To the client. So we want to get the results out of here. So we pass await response.json. We set the type of this object here to a unsplash search response so that we get auto completion. Now in here we can find our results. I mean, you can also remove this, but then results is of type any. This is just a bit better for TypeScript. And then we want to return this. So again, we call return next response dot json, but instead of an error like up here, we simply send the results back to the front end. And this is our API route handler. This is a little server endpoint directly inside our Next.js project. But again, you don't have to use these API route handlers as your backend in your Next.js project. You can just as well connect it to an express backend, for example. And in fact, this is what we do in my paid Next.js course, because in my opinion, for larger projects, a separate backend is often more convenient. But for smaller projects, these API route handlers are great. Okay, let's go back into our search page here. Now we actually want to fetch this data. Now when you fetch data client-side in a React app, you have to put it into a state. So at the top, we create a const with scrap brackets. The first value is search results. This is the state where we will store our search results in. And then we need a setter function, set search results. If you have no idea what this is, then you have to check out my Mern Beginner course again, because they explain this. We assign this to use state. We want to initialize this with a value of null, because when we open this page, we don't have any search results yet. But we want to tell TypeScript that we expect an array of unsplash images here, right? But it doesn't know this type because we just set the default value to null. So after use state, we add a pair of angle brackets and here we can set the type of this explicitly. We want to set this to unsplash image, array, scrap brackets, or null, which is the initial value. So we make a vertical bar and add null as the second type. So now search results is always of type unsplash image array or null. Then we need a state for the loading indicator that will be shown while the request is running. 
so we create another state search results loading and the setter z search results loading in camel case we initialize this with use state false and since false is a boolean the boolean type is automatically inferred by a typescript and we don't have to set this explicitly then we duplicate this line and we change this one here to a search results loading is error and z search results loading is error as the name implies, this state will be set to true if something went wrong with our fetch request and we want to show an error message instead. Now in a small project like this, it's fine to manage these states for the loading state and the error and so on ourselves. But in production apps, you should use a library like SWR for client-side fetching, which adds a lot of feature like automatic caching of these client-side responses, automatic race condition prevention, deduplication and so on. So it does a lot of the stuff that Next.js does server-side, just client-side for client-side fetching. Here for simplicity, we will not use SWR, but again, we use this in my paid Next.js course. And I also have a separate SWR tutorial here on YouTube where we learn all of this, just if you want to check this out. Then instead of showing an alert dialog here, when we submit the form, we want to fetch the data and manage our states. So when we submit a new search query, first of all, we will set the existing search results to null so that our result list gets empty again, because instead we want to show the progress below. We will also set the error back to false, because if there was an error message for the last request and we send a new one, then we want to remove the error message. And we set search results loading to true which will then show the progress banner. Then we want to make a fetch request to our endpoint that we just set up. So const response equals await fetch. We want to make this to a slash API where we put our route handler slash search, which is the name of the folder here. And then remember, we have to send the search query as a URL search param. So we add question mark query equals, and then we append the query that we entered into the input field. And again, this detour over our own backend route is necessary because we can't put any API credentials into our client code. We can only do this on our own backend. So the actual request to the Unsplash API has to happen on our server. Then we want to get the articles value out of the response. Remember here we are return the search results, which is an array of unsplash images. So below response, we create a const images, which will be of type unsplash image array. And we assign this to a response.json as usual with an await in front of it. And then we can simply set our search results state to this images array and we can display them in our UI. Now, since this is an asynchronous request and this can throw an error, we want to wrap all of this into a try catch block. So we put this into the try block. In the catch block, we want to lock the error, which we do with console.error and we pass the error here. And we want to set search results loading as error to true so that we can show an error message in the UI. And in the finally block, no matter if the request was successful or not, we want to set search results loading back to false to hide the loading spinner. Okay, that's it for the fetching part. And now we want to put this into our UI here as well. So below our input form, I want to put another div with the class names dflex to make this a flex box, flex column to have all elements below each other. And whenever we put in here, I want to align in the center horizontally with align item center. In here, I want to put the loading spinner and the error messages. So we put a block of curly braces in here. We check search results loading to ampersand signs. Again, I explained this in my Mern beginner course. This is just React syntax. 
If search results loading is true, we want to render a React spinner with the animation border. And again, we can use React Bootstrap components in here because this is a client component. If there is an error message, so below we check search results loading is error. If this is true, we want to show some text in a paragraph that says something went wrong. Please try again. And if we got a response back from the server successfully, but there are no results in there, then we also want to show a message. So as long as we don't have a response, the response is set to null, right? But if we get an empty response, this will not be null anymore. This will be an empty array. So below we can check search results. Then we use the save call operator because this can be null. If the length of this array is equal to zero, then we want to render another text that says nothing found, try a different query. And then below we want to render the actual search results, right? So I put this outside of the stuff. In a block we first check if search result is not null anymore. Again, we do this with this ampersand sign. If this is the case, we want to map the search results in here. So we add an empty fragment, which looks like this, because now we can put another block of curly braces in here. This wouldn't work without these empty fragment elements. And in here we want to take our search results and map them into images, similar to how we did it on the topics page. Just that this time we only do it when we actually have a response from the server. So here we call search results dot map. Again, we get each image passed in this map call. Again, we wrap the return value into parentheses. And then we want to turn each of them into a next image. The SRZ, as usual, is image.urls.raw. Again, we hard code the width and height to 250 pixels, just like we did it on the topics page. We set the alt to image.description again. And again, we have to define a key because this is an array. Again, we set this to image.urls.raw. And then I want to use the same class name as we used on the topics page for our images. This is contained inside the topic page module. Now, of course, we could put the style outside of the app folder into a styles folder and use it in both places. But in this source code here, I want to make it very clear that we can collocate these CSS files with each page. So instead, I'm going to copy paste this CSS module and also paste it in the search folder and just rename it to a search page.module.css. But we keep the same class in here. So now in the search page, we import this CSS module, import styles from dot slash search page module dot CSS. And then down here, we use this class on the image class name styles dot image, which again is the class that's contained in the CSS module. Then we close this image tag with a slash and a closing anchor bracket and align this here properly. One more thing before we try this out, I also want to disable this button while we are currently loading a response so that we can't click it twice in a row. So we set the disabled prop of the button to search results loading. So let's try this out. Now I can type something in here, for example, hamburger. When we click this, the button should be disabled. We should see our progress banner, and then we should see a list of results. So this seems to work. And this data is fetched client side. This is fetched with JavaScript using state. And I shouldn't have searched for hamburgers because this looks way too delicious. I think I have to get a hamburger today. Anyway, as usual, I want to put an alert message in here that just describes what is happening on this page so that you have a reminder later. 
This page fetches data client side. In order to not leak API credentials, the request is sent to a Next.js route handler, that's our backend handler, that runs on the server. This route handler then fetches the data from the Unsplash API and returns it to the client. Just one more thing, I want to add another entry to our navbar. I want to put another nav link behind our dropdown like this which will bring us to a slash search and it will say search, right? So this is how this menu item now looks. Now you learned all the different fetching and caching strategies in the new Next.js 13 app router. So now you are equipped to build your own modern Next.js websites. But there's one more thing left that you don't want to skip here. We want to deploy this whole project. And we will not only deploy it, we will also add a social media image. So a rectangular image that will be shown when we uh, paste a link to our website, for example, on Twitter or Facebook. Okay, so when you build a website, you usually want to have a social media preview image on there, which looks like this, basically. You post a link to your website, you see the title and the description that we already set up in the metadata tag, but you also want to have an image, right? just so that the links look good. For this, I created this social media preview image here. Again, this is very big because I zoomed in. The actual size is smaller, but this doesn't matter. And we want to use this image for the social media preview. Now, if you downloaded the starting point project in the beginning, then this image will already be inside the project. Otherwise, you can download it from the GitHub repository in the video description. And then using this in the Next.js app router is very simple. We just have to put it inside the app folder. So we download this image here from GitHub. And then we can just drag and drop this image here into our app folder. Now here comes the magic. If this image has this exact name, opengraph-image.png, then Next.js will automatically use it as the social media preview image. In the old pages directory in Next.js, we had to set this up manually in the head tag by passing the URL of the OG image, which we usually would put into the public folder. But in the new app router, this has been simplified. We just need an image with this exact name. The same is the case for the fav icon here. You can just put a fav icon.ico file directly into your app folder and Next.js automatically uses it as the fav icon. The little icon that we can see up here. You can also replace this for a different fav icon. And there are different generators available for this online. Just search for fav icon generator and you can create these little icons here from any graphic you want. Okay, before we deploy this project, I just want to add some text to the home page. Instead of this placeholder div, I copy paste this in here. You don't have to add this if you don't want to, but you can copy paste this whole layout from the GitHub link. And we have to import the alert from our components folder. Add components slash bootstrap should be correct. And in here should be our alert. I just added this so that the front page looks a bit better and there is some explanation about this project here. And then deploying this project to Vazel is very easy. You want to publish this in a GitHub repository. This can be a private GitHub repository. And you can easily do this in VS Code over the sidebar here, source control. There you can initialize a GitHub repository and push your project there. So I push this whole project to GitHub and then we go to vazel.com. Here you want to create an account with the same GitHub account that your project is on. If you already have a Vazel account that's not connected to your GitHub account, you can also go to the settings and update the login connections to connect it to your GitHub account. Yeah, then we go into our dashboard and here we can add a new project. And this is very simple. This will show you all the projects on your GitHub account, also the private ones. Here we have our Next.js image gallery. We can import this. We can give this project a name and keep it as it is. It automatically recognizes that this is a Next.js project. We keep the root directory as it is. We don't have to change anything here, but we want to set an environment variable, right? Because we need our unsplash key here. So we use the same key name and paste this value here. Unsplash underscore access underscore key. And here we put the value of the key. Click on add. And then we can deploy the project with one click. 
And the hobby account on Vazel is free and you can also deploy your project for free. Now we have to wait a little bit. This will take less than one minute probably. It builds the project just like it did when we executed npm run build. It fetches the data that we want to cache statically and generates all the pages. You can actually see the log in here. And after this has finished, we get some nice confetti and it says congratulations, your project is deployed. And we actually have a preview URL where we can open this website. This is a Vazel URL, but it's nice to try this out. And you can actually reach this URL over the internet. It has HTTPS and everything it needs and other people can use this. And now our social media image should also work. So let's copy the URL and let's put it into the social share preview here, which is a website that you can use to check how your website looks on social media. So we paste this Vazel URL here and then we should see our social media preview image. And there it is. This here is the metadata title that we set and this is the description. We can also try going to a slash static, which should have a different title, right? Because we overwrote this. And there it is, static fetching, Next.js image gallery. Nice. Now let's just check if our website still works. So here we should get our static image by Will Rust, a nice monkey. And when we refresh the page, we see the same image again. Let's go to the profile page. Here we see our dynamic data with the first name and the last name. And the reason why this page opens so fast, even though we are fetching data here, is because Next.js actually goes ahead and refetches these links if they appear on the page. This is just another nice optimization that you get out of the box with Next.js. Okay, some dude hanging in a tree, whatever. If we refresh this page, we should get a new image. And incremental static regeneration and the other pages should work as well. So we get a new image, refresh, refresh, same image, same image. And when we wait for 15 seconds, we get a new image. The topic pages work as well. Those are pre-rendered, really cool. And search, let's search for monkey again. And there are cute little monkeys. And the cool thing about deploying your Next.js project to Vazel is that continuous deployment is automatically set up. Meaning that when we make changes to our project and push these changes to the main branch on GitHub, then Vazel will automatically go ahead and redeploy these changes. So you don't have to do this manually. You just have to push your changes to the main branch of your project. I hope you enjoyed this free Next.js course. If you did, please leave a like on this video and subscribe to the channel if you haven't yet, because I'm planning to create more Next.js projects in the future and maybe some other technologies as well. Also, again, I have an advanced Next.js course that you can check out. This one is paid, but there we build a much bigger project with more advanced features. You can find the course under codinginflow.com slash Next.js. I will also put this link in the video description below. And I also started sending regular web development tips to my newsletter. I send about one email every one to two weeks. And there I put some tips. For example, I summarized my findings between the Next.js pages directory and the app directory in my last newsletter. I would be very happy if you join this newsletter. You can find it under codingandflow.com slash newsletter. And again, I will put the link into the video description as well. And then I wish you a nice rest of the day. As usual, happy coding. Take care.